our identity, personality, and behavior is hugely influenced by genetics. Genes take a major part of the blame if you are a creative genius, a natural-born leader, or else the life of the party. <laughs> if they malfunction in a very, but very bad way, genes can also be the culprit for several diseases, including cancer and neurological conditions like ALS. Genes are essentially single paragraphs in our DNA, which is the book of life. Every paragraph adds a racy detail to the story, or else it changes the course of events that have already happened. In a similar manner, genes give us unique traits, or else they alter existing ones. I'm fascinated by genes. More correctly, I'm obsessed with genes. But that is what you expect from a gene hunter. I spend literally every single second of the day tracking down genes, exposing the spicy ingredient they inject into life. What I do harks back to a gentle, shy, and studious 19th century Austrian monk who shunned the dull life of the monastery for solitary yet exciting experiments on peace. Gregor Mendel gave us the answer as to why children bear a striking resemblance in looks and actions to their parents. <laughs> Genes are the reason why the sins of the fathers or mothers haunt the descendants. Growing up, I had my own personal Mendel. Muscular, know-it-all, and arrogant. Certainly a far cry from the original version. The preposterous impersonator was my father. A breather by trade, my pop's mission ultimately selecting the bold and beautiful. And as his only offspring with masculine qualities, I was the one ordered around to select his crops and tend his livestock. I hated it, and I certainly loathed his occupation. Whenever I could, I sneaked away to watch my favorite TV series, that is where I met my imaginary hero, the code-cracking, crime-solving Dr. Gil Grissom, in the critically acclaimed drama CSI Crime Scene Investigation. I wanted to become like the exceptional Dr. Gil. There was, however, a stumbling block. Dr. Gil was an insect lover, and I didn't harbor any particular love whatsoever for insects. Nonetheless, I had to cherry-pick to emulate my hero. I settled for one of the tiniest. I settled for the humble fruit fly. Little did I know that this tiny bug is the most studied creature in the universe. More than 10 massive studies are published on the fly every single day. Can you believe it? That's more than the number of Trump tweets per day, which averages around seven. <laughs> the X factor of the fruit fly is its closeness to humans. An astonishing number of human genes are present in the fly. And if humans are similar to fruit flies, then the favorite behavior of fruit flies is, unsurprisingly, sex. Flies are ferocious lovers. They also live their life in the fast lane. So one human year is squeezed in just one day 
of a fruit fly. Combine these assets with a non-precedented ability to create misprints in the Book of Life. For instance, turning eyes from a bright apple red color to snow white clinched the eye gene. Not 10 or 20, but more than 100 years ago. Fruit flies are micro machines that I exploit to scout and discover genes so small that they fit within the rim of a euro coin. And although I remain a lover of uh, crime stories and a big fan of forensics, the allure to unravel the mysteries of life took over. I flew afar to learn my trade, yet I still ended up breathing flies. Talk about sins of the father. Ah. Now, the fly, I mean, flies have brains too. The fly brain works in exactly the same manner as the human brain, which is the largest and most complex organ in the human body. The only problem with the fly brain is its size. It's just a speck, a pixel on a screen, nearly invisible to the naked eye. Yet, we're able to perform nanosurgery to get to the nerves. And here we have an experienced neurosurgeon doing surgery on a baby fly. Obviously, I'm kidding. The person performing the surgery is a 23-year-old student of mine who mastered the operation after just 20 trials. So easy, yet so tough. The nerves coming out of the spinal cord look like fine silk threads. We call them motor neurons. The motor neurons control the muscles, and they are therefore responsible for the fly's ability to move or to fly. Humans have exactly the same nerves. The motor neurons send messages from the brain to the muscles so that we can speak, eat, breathe, move, and make love. Importantly, these are the nerves that die in motor neuron disease, like ALS, restricting patients to a wheelchair, unable to move. Motor neuron disease, or MND, is a fascinating problem that remains to be solved. We know that misprints in genes can cause this devastating disorder, and there are a large number of genes that crucially allow motor neurons to work correctly. And we think of this ensemble of genes as an orchestra. In an orchestra, every component is essential. If only one instrument is out of tune or is absent, the output is a mediocre Beethoven symphony. Similarly, in MND, a misprint in any one of this orchestra of genes is enough to cause the death of motor neurons. Now, although a music student can tell you all the elements in an orchestra, when it comes to MND, we only know a few of the genes that are required for the health of motor neurons. Scouting for the unknown genes is my lab's mission. And we do it by creating misprints or mutations in genes, one at a time, and then observing whether flies are still capable of doing their second most favorite behavior, and that is flying. If they don't, we are thrilled, because we have discovered yet another gene, a new element in our growing orchestra. And you might not believe it, but we can also strap a fitness band to flies so that we track their number of steps minute by minute. 
And yes, if you observe very carefully, you can see that like us, flies decrease their movement during the night, but are most vigorous before they sleep. I think you know why. <laughs> if we remove an ALS-linked gene, then you can see quite well that the flies do not have the physical strength they require to keep up with the normal flies. And this is an amazing result. We are excited to have discovered a handful of genes that are required for the health of the motor neuron. We have even succeeded in entering into unclaimed territory. Hence, we had the privilege of naming genes with quite cool names, like Valet and Gaulos. But wouldn't we be all over the moon if we discovered the conductor of the orchestra? A conductor so good that he or she is capable of steering the orchestra towards playing the finest rendition of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, despite the absence of a key player. A function that supposedly came so easy for Herbert von Karajan, the greatest conductor that ever lived. The conductor is the master gene, the gene that works wonders, the wonder gene capable of replacing the missing gene. And tweaking the gene by drugs or new gene editing technologies will allow us to one day find a treatment for ALS. So next time you see fruit flies hovering over your kitchen fruit bowl, think of them as angels, little people with wings that by day are helping us decipher the ancient book of life. And by night, they are battling against modern day demons, the diseases that plague humanity. Discovery in science is only possible if one has the audacity to imagine, to think differently. But my experience tells me that there is no turning back once you discover the excitement of discovery. This incredible journey wouldn't have been possible without the hard work and enthusiasm of my team of brilliant young scientists at the University of Malta. And we wish to thank the funding bodies that have supported our cutting-edge work throughout the years. Thank you.